That leaves us with fearful avoidant attachment style. What is this? Okay, so this is actually the rarest of the four types. And this is a individual who in the Mary Ainsworth study was sort of kind of displaying a kind of disorganized way of coping when their parents were in the room versus not. So some of these children would actually react very harshly to their parent when they come back mm -hmm. and um, they may actually even be dismissive towards the parent or seemingly angry. Other times they seem not to care all that much when the parents came back, but when the parent was gone and the video was still rolling, they were very distressed without the parent. And yet when the parent came, they acted like they didn't care about the parent. And so it wasn't like one type of cohesive style. Mm -hmm. And as adults, fearful, avoidant people tend to have a more dialectic about their need for other people. So on the one hand, they really want the close relationships. The, on the other hand, they kind of don't want it and fear it and don't want to invest a lot in it. And so they kind of bridge this big spectrum and, and they may act differently depending on how they're feeling at a given moment, which to other people feel erratic because they don't really know how to predict this person's behavior. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people who are fearful avoidant as adults, they tend to be a lot less stable for their friendships as well. Like they have maybe a small group of friends who you know, they feel more comfortable giving to, but then with other people, they can be very dismissive. So in some ways, they kind of embody both of the preoccupied type and the dismissive avoidant type to some degree. Right. I just wanted to jump in real quick and say thank you for watching our YouTube videos. But did you know that you're just scratching the surface? Whether you're a patient here for yourself or you're here for somebody else, or perhaps you're a mental health professional, we can help you along your mental health journey at medcircle.com. There we have a variety of membership options available that will give you access to our video library that has more than 900 titles. You'll also be able to attend live weekly workshops and get your questions answered by the same doctors you're watching here on YouTube. Use the links in the description of this video or just head on over to medcircle.com. All right, now let's go back to the discussion. Are, are there common co-occurring mental health disorders that you could find with someone who has this attachment style? So people who are fearful avoidant in general, they are the ones that um, confer the most psychological risks of all of the four types. And mm. so they are a little bit more prone to anxiety, a little bit more prone to depression, and a little bit more prone to other types of relational issues. And one of the most common ones that is associated with the fearful avoidant type is borderline personality traits, mm. and particularly the dementia about fear of abandonment. Mm -hmm. So actually, in many ways, fearful avoidant types are actually even more afraid of abandonment than the preoccupied types. But unlike the preoccupied types, they're not willing to give over their entire sense of self to be in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And so they have a fear of abandonment, but they're also kind of more resolute in that they still want to have their own space and their own boundaries. And so it creates a lot of difficulties and that barriers is, and yeah. challenges to have relationships. Yeah, absolutely. If somebody feels like this is resonating with them, mm -hmm. Is it like the other ones, likely because their parents were you know, exhibiting the same attachment style? Yeah, in general, fearful avoidant um, children were exposed to parenting styles that were kind of erratic too. Okay. And oftentimes the parents maybe were struggling with certain things like their own anxiety and their own depression so that they weren't able to meet the child's needs consistently. Mm -hmm. And the parents were not always anxious. Sometimes they were anxious, but sometimes they were completely dismissive. And sometimes they weren't there for the child. And sometimes they were too much there for the child. And so I think it, it creates a sort of disorganized attachment in the young child because they're trying to figure out how do I navigate the rest of my life if this is my primary template? And they don't really have one type of coping strategy to go to. So they find themselves kind of almost like kind of wavering in the wind. It's like, whatever people want them to do, they'll do. And sometimes they don't. And it's really interesting because a recent study came out about the sex lives of individuals who have fearful avoidant attachment. And it turns out that in general, they have more sexual partners than the other three attachment types, but also that in general, they may say yes to dates and say yes to sex to people who they're not even necessarily that interested in. And so again, this this idea of, well, I'll kind of just go with the environment and go with the moment, but I'm not sure how much more I want to take it beyond that. You know, do I really actually want to become more intimate with this person in a long-term fashion? So in many ways, as you mentioned, this final attachment style is a lot like anxious, preoccupied, and dismissive avoidant 
hybrid. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And the way that it exhibits in terms of behaviors is that the person will want that closeness and then they'll pull away all of a sudden mm. and they'll want that closeness and pull away. And so in the beginning, they and, may... and not pull away to get the closeness. No, because you know how some people pull away because they want to be chased. Yes, right. It's less so it's, it's more about pulling away and cutting that person off and not looking back. Uh -huh. And so sometimes they may think, well, this relationship is getting too serious or maybe this person has done something that really hurt me. And instead of giving that person a second chance, a fearful avoidant person might do something that really severely cuts off that relationship so that there is no prospect for continuing. Mm -hmm. This is really helpful for people to be aware of mm -hmm. because part of my recovery from depression came from my awareness of my depression. Mm -hmm. My depression is a symptom, it's a condition. It's not who Kyle Kittleson is. Yeah. It's something over here that I can uh, manage yes. appropriately so I can still live my life. Same thing with these attachment styles. These are not diagnosable conditions, mm -hmm. but if we can start to view them as something that's over here and say, all right, this isn't really me. This mm -hmm. is my fearful avoidant attachment that yeah. has taken my whole life to condition. Mm -hmm. So let's go easy on myself a little bit and recognize that I might need to sit down and not fully pull away from this person who means well and, and attack it with that awareness. Mm -hmm, absolutely, yeah. and I think the awareness is key because even people who struggle with fearful avoidant attachment can have satisfying relationships mm -hmm. and can have satisfying friendships and work lives. And in general, people with fearful avoidant don't necessarily have issues with work per se, but when they feel like too many demands are being made on them, they might actually get sort of distressed. They don't like that. They might um, you know, sort of back away from further responsibility if they feel like they're being, they're being asked to do too much. Um, but in relationships and friendships, people with fearful avoidant attachment, as soon as they're aware of those attachment influences and are willing to work on them, can have wonderful relationships as well. So sometimes you get me, I'm dismissive avoidant attachment, almost mm -hmm. to a T, but I would imagine there's a lot of people who heard all those attachment styles and thought, okay, I'm not really one. I'm a little bit of this, I'm a little yeah. bit of that, I'm a little bit of that. Yes. What do people do with that information? Well, I think there's definitely a spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I think when you know that you're on a spectrum, you understand your own strengths and also some areas for improvement. And that's, I think, really the takeaway for people to understand their attachment styles. It's not to pathologize you. It's not to say, oh my gosh, you're insecure. What does this mean? It's not meant to label anybody, although of course there are categories and so inherently they are labels. But if you understand yourself on the spectrum, then you can say, okay, objectively, here are the things that I'm good at and here are the things that maybe are more challenging to me. Mm -hmm. And then you really ask yourself, is it important for me to work on these challenges? And I think sometimes you have to feel like it's impacting your life in a negative way for you to want to work on those challenges. That's so true. Right? I didn't work on my emotional challenges until I recognized they were problems. Right, exactly. Before I would go, that is your problem that I'm not emotionally available to you. Right. That's how I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then once you realize, you know what, maybe I should take responsibility for some of this and maybe I could be better to my friends or maybe I mm -hmm. could create an environment that would be better and more welcoming to a romantic partner, mm -hmm. then you do those things. Mm -hmm. like you have to have the skin in the game to mm -hmm. be able to want to invest, right? But I think it's just in the vein of self-improvement. You know, mm -hmm. Understand where your difficulties are coming from and know that there's ways to challenge it. For somebody who has fearful avoidant attachment, it's really all about establishing consistency because there's a huge level of erraticness. And so a very important exercise for people who are fearful avoidant is to let themselves stay in a distressing emotion or distressing situation for a period of time. Oh, that's hard. Just sit with it. Yeah, sit with it and sit with the fact that you might want to run away or you so might want to clean. Of that? So I think one example would be when you're dating somebody mm -hmm. and you know that that person is maybe not giving you what you need in various ways, whether it's they're being too clean or they're being too dismissive and sitting there and allowing yourself to say, "You know what? I'm going to give it one more date." or I'm gonna give him a few more hours to call me back. Mm -hmm. And being okay with that, as opposed to acting out right there. Because people who are fearful avoidant, sometimes will either get super clingy in that moment, or they'll get super dismissive and they'll say, you know what, forget it, I'm done with you. If you call me back, I'm not even gonna answer the phone. So it's really about stretching their bounds for the ambiguities, the grays, the in-betweens, so that you're not so black and white in your thinking and decision making. I hope you're finding value in this session. And if you are, I invite you to visit medcircle.com or just use the links below this video. 
There you'll learn about what is included in a MedCircle membership. We are more than just a YouTube channel. With the MedCircle membership, you'll have access to a video library of more than 900 titles. You'll also be able to attend weekly live workshops led by the same doctors that you're watching in this session and in other videos on YouTube. And you have the opportunity to ask those doctors your questions. You don't have to do this alone. MedCircle is your perfect mental health care companion. Visit MedCircle.com and we'll see you there. So when are we becoming gray in our thinking and willingly being with somebody who treats us poorly? Right. Because maybe you're supposed to call me back after two days. Right. And I think that's when you have to really check in with yourself and also your family and friends, people who love you and say, do you think this is acceptable behavior? Hmm. Is this me being maybe hypersensitive and just wanting to cut things off? Or is this okay? You know, because we've only gone on two dates and maybe it's all right that he hasn't texted me back in five hours. Maybe it's okay that he gets back to me tomorrow. It's not a bad thing, hmm. you know? And so I think sometimes you do have to rely on your friends when you're not sure if your own barometer isn't unduly influenced by your emotions and your attachment style. Yeah, I yeah. get that. I yeah. get that because I rely on other people to tell me things that I wouldn't be able to do. Yeah. So if you see in areas in your life that you can improve in, mm -hmm. then and other people in your circle can help fill in those gaps, why wouldn't you take advantage of that? Yeah, and even that is a great exercise. Just even asking a friend for help is a great exercise for a fearful avoidant type. True, right? Because generally they want that closeness, but they don't think that they can rely on people. Oof. So it's like they want it, but they think people are gonna disappoint them, so they don't even put themselves out there. But of course, over time, that just reinforces that idea that no one can be there for them because they've never given anybody the opportunity. Right. So give people the opportunity to be there for you, and that also really helps to improve upon on the weaknesses of an individual with a fearful avoidant lifestyle. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're not done quite yet with this conversation. In our next session, we are going to walk through some assessments, the same assessments you can take to determine your attachment style.